Good afternoon, everyone. We're just waiting for all of our attendees and participants um, to be joined to our webinar. We'll start in just a minute or two. Alrighty, it looks like um, all of our attendees have now joined. So welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Lucchesi. I am the Executive Officer of the State Lands Commission. Thank you all for participating in our webinar today. I hope you and your loved ones are staying healthy and safe. Obviously, there is a lot going on in the world with lots of demands and stressors on your time, energy, and capacity. Our goal is to be as efficient and respectful as possible with your time today. Today's webinar will focus on two applications we have received to construct and operate two distinct wind pilot projects in state waters offshore Vandenberg Air Force Base. Today's webinar is the beginning of our outreach and engagement with you all on these applications. We will be sharing a lot of information today about our jurisdiction and authority, our application review process, the specific applications and project proposals, the environmental review process, and decision points for our commission. Given the amount of information that we have to share, there may be limited time for questions and comments. Please know this was intentional. Our goal today is to provide the foundation and context that will serve as a basis for more focused, comprehensive, and meaningful meetings and conversations with you about your perspectives, interests in the proposals, concerns, and questions. We know that these are significant project proposals in state waters. Due to the significance of these projects, we have designed our application and environmental review process to allow for maximum outreach and engagement. Therefore, I really can't stress enough that this is only the beginning of our conversations with you. Throughout the process, we are looking forward to learning from you and listening to your concerns and questions and understanding your challenges, opportunities, and perspectives. Thank you again for your time, and I will hand the virtual mic to Shahed Mishkadi, our project lead on these applications. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. I also would like to take the opportunity and welcome all of you to our first stakeholder outreach meeting to discuss these two offshore wind applications in state waters. As Jennifer mentioned, my name is is Shahed and I'm the chief of two offshore wind applications along with Ken Foster whom you will hear from later today. Um, can I have the, the next slide please? Can, can we have the, um, not the title slide but the uh, slide where it has the uh, logistics. Please move on to the next one. And then next one, please. Okay, here, perfect, thank you. Okay, before we start, I'd like to go over some housekeeping and logistics items to ensure that we're all clear on how this meeting is conducted and how you can provide your feedback. This webinar will be conducted in listen-only mode. Your questions are welcome and will be answered at the end of the webinar Please use the QA feature at the bottom of your screen to type your questions. If you cannot see the icons on the bottom of your screen, please navigate to the bottom of the screen and hover over that area and you will see the options and the icons. If you have any problems, email Michael Farina at slc.ca.gov with technical issues and this email will be presented in the chat session in a few seconds. We will use the chat only to provide important information and links, um, and it's only used by our speakers and other SLC support staff. Next slide, please. So here is the overview of today's agenda. As Jennifer mentioned, the Commission is currently in the early scoping phase, 
for the two offshore wind projects in state waters off the coast of Vandenberg Air Force Base. The applications are submitted by Ideal USA Inc and uh, Sierco Projects Corporations. Those are the two companies that have submitted the applications. This is our first stakeholder outreach. And in today's meeting, we will introduce and provide details about the proposed projects, discuss the commission's lease application process, identify a preliminary list of likely affected air resources, and describe the next steps, including staff's plan to host additional focused stakeholder outreach meetings and discussions. We think it's extremely important for this audience to get familiar with the commission's lease application process and be clear on for any status means we'll move forward for, to initiation of environmental analysis under CEQA. It is also important to clarify that neither application can be presented to the commission for consideration of approval until environmental review and analysis is completed. Um, can I have the next slide, please? These topics are broad and the invitees and participants of today's meeting also cover a large and diverse group of stakeholders. Our goal today is to introduce these concepts to you. Future sessions will be held next year with smaller and more focused groups so we can get more specific feedback and address the concerns of the various groups involved. To achieve our goal, we have a panel of commission staff over the, covering uh, the various aspects of these projects today. There are many more staff who work with us through this process, but you will only hear from a few of us today. I have the pleasure of moderating this session, and it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists to you in a few minutes. After the panel discussion, we will have around 30 minutes for Q&A, and then Jennifer Lucchesi will provide the closing remarks. Due to meeting time constraints and the anticipated large number of participants today, Verbal questions and comments may be limited. However, we know that there is significant interest in these two proposed projects. We will respond to as many questions as we can today in this session, and we respond to the ones we do not get to today via email or maybe even a phone call. We look forward to your feedback so we can continue to learn together and from each other on these very important projects. My colleague Jennifer Maddox will facilitate the QA session. Jen Maddox is our science policy advisor and tribal liaison in the commission's executive office. Jennifer will provide a general background on offshore uh, wind in California, both in federal and state waters, state waters. Jen is followed by Ken Foster, who is a public land manager within land management division of SLC. Ken will go over how the commission processes lease applications. After Ken, you will hear from Jason Ramos, who is a senior environmental scientist within SLC's uh, DEPM, which is the Department of Environmental Planning and Management Division. Jason will go over more of the specific details of these two applications. And uh, of course, joining us through this whole presentation is Eric Gillis, who is the Assistant Chief of Environmental Planning and Management Division. So without further ado, I would like to hand the session over to Jennifer Maddox so she can start her presentation. And I thank all of you for attending today. I think we are having an issue changing the slide. So I
I don't know if Phil is able to hear me. Jennifer Maddox. Hi, Jen. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Shahed, for that um, awesome overview and kickoff. Um, I'm really excited to see how many participants there are today. I think this is a great turnout. And I thank you again, as Jennifer Lucchesi mentioned, thank you so much for taking 90 minutes out of your day to join us here on this informational webinar. I'm Jennifer Maddox. I'm the Science Policy Advisor and Tribal Liaison for the Commission. Um, and I'm going to uh, just take a few minutes here at the beginning of the webinar to walk through the bigger picture of the offshore wind development activities off the California coast in both state and federal waters, what they're doing, what we're doing, and how these processes are different. This has been, I would say, the number one most common question we've gotten um, so far from uh, folks uh, coming to our website and sending us emails. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, the first thing I wanted to do before even getting into the status of the projects, the state and federal um, efforts and the uh, California's overall policy development, I wanted to make sure everybody's aware of our website and um, you know, give you this picture of some important parts of, of that public facing page. And we are gonna have Christina drop the direct link to our website into the chat um, that you can use and then maybe bookmark this. Uh, so there's a ton of information on this state applications webpage that we've made. Uh, it explains the overview of the projects, um, it explains uh, some links to additional resources and information. We have a frequently asked questions. And then you can see here, we've provided both an email address. This you would find really handy to um, let us know. If you don't think that we already know who you are, please send us an email. Uh, if you'd like to be to participate in a focused stakeholder meeting or a one on one interview, you can use that email. Also, please stay informed, receive updates. This little box puts, uh, puts you on our mailing list so that if we have uh, another webinar or if we are having a commission meeting or other important updates and milestones, we will send out to the listserv. So please join our listserv. We've also selected a few maps um, and we are going to be showing where um, the sources of the maps. We put these maps up as little snapshots. They're not anything that you can manipulate. They're just still images. But in our additional resources and also in the chat box, we will drop where these came from. So a lot of the things that we'll be covering are also on the webpage. We'll be, uh, I've already seen a question come in and yes, we will be posting both the slide deck from today's webinar as well as the recording of this webinar onto this webpage afterwards so that you can review all of these materials at your own pace. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so I think you guys all know that we're doing things a little differently with these applications um, and there is a good reason for that. We do not have any offshore floating renewable energy wind uh, in our state waters or our federal waters yet off the coast of California. This is a new technology for us. So we are treating it um, with the attention and sensitivity that it deserves. And because we're doing things a little bit different than we might normally do a routine lease application, I wanted to orient all of you attendees as to a few things. So the question is, what are you guys doing? And where are we? Is it over? Am I too late? Um, so this figure is meant to help orient all of you as to the process that we're following, where we are in that process, and at what stages you'll have opportunity for both formal and informal input. I've also marked on this figure 
a couple of major decision point steps, those are places where our commission would be weighing in on whether and how to proceed. So you can see that throughout the application processing, we will be conducting the collection of data on our own um, and through our scoping and public engagement and through a potentially a consultant and other resources to help us understand what's going on out there and how do we evaluate impacts. We also have very importantly, the next three ribbons, tribal consultation with our California Native American governments, environmental justice outreach to our environmental justice communities along the coast, and stakeholder input from other groups such as fishermen, local citizens, local elected officials, environmental groups, industry groups, port groups, and many others. So you can see the little green bar down at the bottom that says you are here or we are here. So what we've decided to do is back up before even the CEQA process and do this early public scoping and consultation. So you can see that we're at the very beginning of this process and there are multiple uh, phases to this process and multiple times for formal and informal uh, public participation, comment at meetings, and comment and uh, engagement through our stakeholder process. Both uh, the application processing and the CEQA EIR preparation and comment process, you'll see separate figures that dive down into these two areas in future slides by Kim Foster and Jason Ramos. Okay, next slide, please. All right, a couple of things to clarify about uh, the state of California policy and going through the federal versus state initiatives. So probably a lot of you are more aware, uh, more familiar with the federal process, which is led by BOEM, um, than the state applications process. So here are the couple of things that we're looking at for the Boeing California Offshore Wind Task Force. This was established in 2016 to initiate coordination for efforts off the California coast. I apologize. <laughs> efforts off the California coast. Um, and again, Boeing is the lead federal agency and the Energy Commission is the lead state agency for policy and planning. These are three areas that are off, one in Northern California and two in Central California. They are for commercial scale development. Thank you, next slide. Now in terms of state policy, um, we have some really important um, foundational policies and laws that are guiding us. Meeting California's climate goals requires really focused action to quickly transform our energy system away from fossil fuels. And uh, you're probably aware of some uh, legislative and executive actions from our state leaders, and we champion those here at the commission as well. One that I'll focus on is SB 100. This sets a goal of 100% renewable energy procurement by 2045. And as you can see from this graphic, um, offshore wind is an important part of meeting this goal. Now, I will mention that I pulled this graphic from a presentation by the Energy Commission. They are part of a joint effort uh, to, to produce an SB100 report, um, and that is where a lot of data is stored. And I will have Christina drop a link to that uh, Energy Commission SB100 webpage into the chat. There's a lot of great information on there and you can sign up. Uh, they do some uh, public meetings and webinars from time to time and it's a great thing to uh, be up to date on. Next slide, please. Okay, so, uh, you know, we wanna say at this point, we believe in an all of the above approach. The commission itself is excited to be one of the leaders in our transition to a clean energy future. And we're interested in working in partnership with all of the people of California here along the coast to figure out the best path forward. We need to kick our reliance on fossil fuels and take action to combat climate change. We want to ensure that our environment and our economy can thrive together. 
but we want to have a thoughtful, comprehensive, and equitable transition. The success in these efforts will involve developing diversity, a diverse portfolio, numerous locations, and at numerous scales. So with this in mind, before I hand off to the technical portion of this webinar, I want to emphasize this last bullet on this slide. The state water's applications are completely independent from the Boehm call areas and the leasing on the Outer Continental Shelf. These were not solicited uh, uh, applications for the state waters. Uh, and when we receive an application, we process it. They are not necessary precursors. They are not meant uh, to delay the moving forward of the Boehm task force and Boehm call areas. They are not, although they are called demonstration or small scale or pilot projects, these are names that are given to, um, to illustrate the size, the very small size, as opposed to a commercial scale. And they are not meant in any way to say that the research or the study objectives coming out of these potential projects are uh, things that are, that are required to happen before BOEM can move forward. So I wanted to make sure that participants understand that so that you know that if you are an interested party, um, you probably are looking at needing to pay attention to both. Uh, so uh, that was a question that we've been getting a lot and I wanted to make sure that I said something about it. So next slide is my uh, pleasure to introduce Ken Foster. Ken Foster is our public land manager in the land management division. And he's going to be walking us through a little bit about how it is that we receive, accept, and process applications for leases. And I think this will answer many of the questions that we've already been getting about, uh, about what we're doing here today. Ken? Thank you, Jennifer. I am Ken Foster. I'm a public land manager with our commission's land management division. Our division has the coordinating responsibility for lease application review and processing, among other things. I'm going to take you through a brief high-level overview of the initial steps in the commission's process and identify where the Sierco and IDL applications currently stand in that process. Next slide, please. Once an application requesting the use and occupation of state tide and submerged lands is submitted, the commission has a legal obligation to review that application. Staff generally cannot reject an application and the commission has a specified amount of time to act on it. Within 180 days of application receipt, if the requested use does not require an environmental impact report, and within 90 days of EIR completion when an EIR is needed. Next slide, please. The Commission has the authority to issue leases for the use and occupation of the state's tide and submerged lands, which extend three nautical miles offshore. To legally use and occupy tide and submerged lands, an application must be submitted requesting a specific use within a specific time frame. Next slide, please. Once an application is submitted, commission staff has an initial 30-day review period to determine if the application is complete or incomplete. An application is deemed complete if information is provided by the applicant to allow staff to determine several things, including the nature and extent of the state land or resource involved, the appropriate compensation for the proposed use and occupation, the level and scope of California Environmental Quality Act review, and if the use is consistent with commission policy, practice, and procedures, conducive to public access, is consistent with environmental safeguards and state policies, and is otherwise in the state's best interests. Next slide, please. An application is incomplete if there is not enough information to address the points discussed on the previous slide. Within the initial 30-day review window, staff will provide an applicant with written notification of application status, and if the application is incomplete, the notification will also include a list of additional information still required. A complete application may also require additional information to supplement, amplify, or clarify information already received. This need for supplemental information or data gathering can continue throughout the application process. Next slide, please. After initial application review, and regardless of whether an application is deemed complete or incomplete, staff can continue processing. Depending on application status, this ongoing processing might include public outreach to environmental justice stakeholders or other stakeholders as we're doing today, 
tribal consultation, agency consultation, beginning the CEQA review and CEQA document preparation when the commission is acting as the CEQA lead agency, and other commission document preparation, including a lease, and a staff report, which is used to inform the commission and the public of the proposed project, staff's review and analysis, stakeholder input and feedback, and staff's recommended action, either approval or denial. Next slide, please. The commission must authorize the lease before any project can commence on tied and submerged lands. And when the commission is the CEQA lead agency, the commission's action to approve or deny a lease will typically consider CEQA document adoption and lease issuance at the same time. Commission leases include terms that also require the applicant to obtain all local, state, and federal regulatory approvals before any project authorized by the commission can commence. Next slide, please. This is a simplified graphic of the process I just described to show current application status for the two offshore wind projects being discussed today. Staff has, de has deemed Sierco's application complete and is currently waiting for IDL to provide additional information requested in a recent incomplete letter. Jason Ramos will be taking over now to discuss the CEQA aspect of these applications and provide an overview for both projects. Jason. Thank you, Ken. Good afternoon, I'm Jason Ramos, Senior Environmental Scientist, with the Commission's Environmental Planning and Management. I'm the project manager for the Commission's CEQA process. Here, uh, referred to as the California Environmental Quality Act process, uh, which I'll be covering for both projects. I'll be providing an overview of the description of both projects as described by the applicants, IDEAL and Sierraco. And given the conceptual similarities of both projects, I'll be attempting to describe the proposed projects of both applicants concurrently, including an additional project alternative proposed by IDEAL and my presentation will also include an overview of the CEQA process for both projects. Next slide, please. Both applications thus far have endured several incomplete application letters and ongoing requests for more information to satisfy CEQA information requirements. The following is a description of the information gathered thus far, which in, does include information gaps for both projects where we are continuing to gather additional information. According to the applicants, these are demonstration projects to demonstrate the ability of the projects to meet their intended goals and objectives, which are numerous. Some of the key objectives as proposed by both applicants include providing further study to demonstrate the feasibility of floating platform technology for wind turbines and state waters, demonstrating the feasibility of designated California ports for wind, floating wind turbine construction services, demonstrating potential as energy source for Vandenberg Air Force Base and the California Energy Grid, and providing opportunity for evaluation and monitoring of environmental, tribal, commercial, and social impacts, as well as scientific research and development goals. Next slide, please. Project area is located along the coastline of Vandenberg Air Force Base in Western Santa Barbara County. Some of the key onshore features include the existing surf substation to the north near the mouth of the Santa Inez River, the existing substation end to the south, the Southern Pacific Railroad on the coast, and the existing Vandenberg boat dock on the south end of Arguello. Some of the key offshore features include the Vandenberg State Marine Reserve within the green boundary, the state jurisdiction boundary, represented as the blue line boundary, and the platform Irene, just beyond the state boundary in federal waters, which includes an, an existing electric cable and pipeline on the sea floor extending through the Vandenberg State Marine Reserve and connecting to shore near the mouth of the San Andres River. And next, please. Moving on to the next slide. Thank you. So this is a combined project area map showing the proposed project of both applicants. And I want to provide a quick disclaimer that this map is not to scale and does not represent surveyed boundaries. It's just a map for planning purposes to show project information. 
IDL's proposed wind turbine field is located on the north end, surrounded by the blue perimeter, representing IDL's proposed lease area. And Sierco's proposed wind turbine field is located on the south end, also showing their proposed lease area uh, with their proposed blue perimeter. The lease area for both projects is approximately just over six square miles respectively within the state jurisdictional boundary and outside of the Vandenberg State Marine Reserve. Each project proposes up to four wind turbines. IDL is proposing four wind turbines capable of producing up to 10 megawatts for each wind turbine. And Sierra is proposing four wind turbines capable of producing 12 to 15 megawatts for each wind turbine. The construction and assembly of the structural components of the wind turbines and floating platforms for both projects would occur at a designated port location along the coast. IDL has identified Port Wanimi for wind turbine construction activities. And Sirico is also considering Port Wanimi as well as the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach for their wind turbine construction activities. Barges would be used as the preferred method of transport to deliver the assembled wind turbines to the project area for Vandenberg Air Force Base. And some final assembly of the floating wind turbine structural opponents could occur as well at the project area. The assembled floating wind turbines would be positioned into the proposed grid pattern for each project, where the floating wind turbine platforms would individually include up to six mooring lines anchored to the seafloor in approximately 60 to 100 meters water depth. The floating wind turbines for each project would be connected with an inner array electric cable shown as the green cable connecting the wind turbines that would be weighted to a mid-water depth of approximately 30 or more meters. The southerly positioned floating wind turbine within the grid area for each project would connect to a static electric cable shown as the solid gold line for Sierco and the dashed gold line for IDL that would extend to the seafloor and be buried to an approximate depth of 1.5 meters below the seafloor the laying and trenching of the cable for both projects would generally be accomplished through use of a cable laying vessel that would assist with the feeding of the cable to the seafloor and trenching of the cable. And IDL also proposes use of a remotely operated vehicle to assist with these activities. Sierra's preferred method for trenching and burial of the cable is a jet trenching method that would inject a high powered water stream to fluidize the sediments to allow the cable to sink under its own weight to the desired depth below the seafloor, whereas IDL is proposing a cable burial plow method as their preferred method for trenching and burial of the cable. For any hard bottom areas encountered within the cable routes for both projects, the cable would be armored with rock or hard mattress material to cover and protect the cable on the seafloor. For both projects, the static electric cable would be routed to the south end of Point Arguello at the same approximate location where the onshore landing of the electric cable would fall below ground through use of horizontal directional drilling to connect to a proposed onshore electric substation near the existing Vandenberg dock. The overall route of the offshore static electric cable would also be part of the lease area for each project as a dedicated cable corridor area and both applicants have cited all offshore components of their project outside of the Vandenberg State Marine Reserve. From the proposed onshore electric substation on the south end of Point Arguello, both, pro both projects proposed construction of an overhead electric transmission line that would be routed approximately 2.5 miles to the existing substation end to the north, shown as the gold line. With both projects, some additional electrical infrastructure improvements are proposed to substation N for connection to PG&E's utility system. The specific route of the transmission line from the south side of Point Arguello to substation N is different for each project, which I'll illustrate later in the presentation. Sierra is also proposing an option to continue their transmission line an additional approximate 5.8 miles to the existing surf, surf substation to the north just south of the Santa Inez River mouth, 
where additional electrical infrastructure improvements are also proposed to the substation. Next slide, please. These are different types of floating wind platform platforms that were considered for both projects. IDEAL is proposing the barge platform type for their four wind turbines. And Sierco is also proposing the barge platform type for two of its wind turbines and the tension leg platform type for their other two wind turbines. Again, each floating wind turbine for both projects would be secured with up to six mooring lines anchored to the seafloor. Sierra's wind turbines would have an approximate rotor diameter of 225 meters and a steel tower hub height of approximately 137.5 meters above highest astronomical tide. And IDEAL's wind turbines would have an approximate rotor diameter of 174 meters and a steel tower hub height of approximately 110 meters. Next slide, please. This is a cross-section view of the inner array cable that's intended to generally represent both projects. Again, the inner array cable connecting the floating wind turbines would be weighted to a mid-water depth of approximately 30 or more meters as represented on the left side of the wind turbine. And the right side of the wind turbine provides illustration for how the inner array cable would be connected to the seafloor for a connection to the static electric cable it would be routed to shore below the seafloor as previously explained. Next slide, please. As previously mentioned, the routes of the proposed onshore overhead transmission line are different for each project. Starting at the south end of Point Arguello, both projects propose the construction of a new electric substation where the new offshore electric cable would connect to the red line represents IDEAL's overhead transmission line route, which substantially aligns adjacent to existing roads and extends to the existing substation end to the north, where proposed energy output from the project would connect with PG&E's utility infrastructure. The gold line with black dots represents Sierco's overhead transmission line route, which appears to align through more of an open space alignment up to substation end to the north. As noted on the slide, Sierra Co has chosen this alignment as modeled from the Callaway project previously conducted for this area. Next slide, please. IDEAL is proposing an additional alternative to use Platform Irene's existing electric cable for connection to the existing onshore surf substation. Based on preliminary information from IDEAL, the platform Irene cable is partially buried under accumulated sediments. And we are currently in the process of gathering additional information regarding the existing conditions of the cable and any potential work that may be needed for proposed use of the cable. IDEAL proposes to cut and cap the section of the Irene cable connecting back to platform Irene and the new static electric cable extending from the northernmost wind turbine within IDEAL's wind turbine grid would be spliced into the Irene cable connecting to the onshore surf substation. And yeah, next slide, please. Moving on to description of the CEQA process for these projects. The State Lands Commission will serve as the lead agency for preparation of an environmental impact report or EIR. And given the overall similarities of the proposed projects by both applicants and the EIR requirement for a project alternatives analysis, commission staff intends to repair one EIR for both projects. Starting on the left side of the chart is an overlay of commission staff's process for data collection, tribal consultations, stakeholder input, and environmental justice that is intended to be initiated at the beginning of the EIR process, it will be ongoing through the remaining process for EIR preparation, as also previously mentioned. Starting with the first box, currently we are moving forward with our public outreach process as our first step for public awareness, participation, and input to assist with the first phase of the EIR process, which is early public consultation in the scoping process, which will include preparation 
of a detailed description of both projects and a preliminary environmental assessment that will include some of the components of an initial study based on information gathered this far and other available information and studies. This information will be publicly noticed through the State Clearinghouse and will include a public review and comment period of not less than 30 days. Commission staff is proposing the early public consultation and scoping process to maximize opportunities for public input and information gathering prior to proceeding with the notice of preparation scoping process for an EIR. Following the public comment period for the preliminary environmental assessment, moving to the next box, Commission staff would work towards preparing a staff report to be agendized with a public commission meeting, requesting commission consideration to release a statement of interest or SOI, to contract with an environmental consultant for preparation of an EIR. And the public meeting would include opportunity for public comment prior to commission action on the SOI. If the commission approves the SOI, commission staff would proceed with releasing the SOI and work towards selecting and contracting with an environmental consultant. Moving, to the, moving next to the notice of preparation process, concurrent with releasing the SOI, commission staff would release a notice of preparation or NOP through the state clearinghouse that would include updates to the preliminary environmental assessment and project description information. Public would be given a 30 day comment and review period for the NOP during which time a public meeting will also be held by commission staff to take public scoping comments to assist with preparation of the EIR. Following close of the public comment period for the NOP, moving to the next box, commission staff would work with the contracted consultant to prepare the draft EIR that would be composed of the information gathered through ongoing data collection for baseline information stakeholder, public agency, tribal consultations, and all the sections required for an EIR, including background and introduction, project description, environmental impact assessment of affected resources and mitigation measures, a project alternatives analysis, including selection of the environmentally superior alternative, mitigation monitoring program, and technical appendices, among other required components of an EIR. In addition, commission staff would include a section entitled Other Commission Considerations, which would include an analysis of social, commercial, economic, and physical impacts not required by CEQA, such as impacts on commercial fishing, environmental justice, the commission's significant lands inventory, and climate change impacts that could be experienced during the life of the project, such as sea level rise and storm events. Following completion of the draft EIR, moving to the next box, Commission staff would release the draft EIR for a 60-day public comment and review period, during which time Commission staff would also hold a public meeting to take public comment on the draft EIR. Following close of the draft EIR, public comment period, moving to the, the next box for final EIR, Commission staff would assess and provide responses to public comments received and provided that no significant information changes have occurred, commission staff would complete the final EIR. And moving to the final box, provided all other lease requirements have been satisfied, commission staff would work towards preparing a staff report to be agendized with a public commission meeting for commission consideration to certify the EIR and consider lease approval it would include opportunity for public comment prior to commission action on these items. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of resources that could be potentially affected by the project. The bolded list includes affected resources intended to be uh, anticipated to be evaluated in conformance with CEQA. In the bottom category includes other commission considerations, which again would include commercial fishing, environmental justice, sea level rise, significant lands inventory. So these are the overall resources commission staff has identified for evaluation, starting with the preliminary environmental assessment included during the early phase of early public consultation and scoping, followed by a more comprehensive evaluation in the EIR. Next slide, please.
we have a broad audience of stakeholders, public agencies, special interest groups, and we are asking for your input on your respective areas of expertise, jurisdiction, or special interests to assist with our initial scoping process and preliminary environmental assessment. Helpful scoping comments could include identifying the location and extent of environmental impacts and potential mitigation measures, including recommendations for development of a comprehensive mitigation monitoring program for biological resources, tribal resources, and other affected resources. Scoping comments can include recommending issues to be addressed in the EIR and other commission considerations, including recommendations for working with the commercial fishing industry and environmental justice community to identify impacts and develop mitigation measures. Scoping comments could include recommending project alternatives that would avoid or reduce project impacts. To name a few examples of helping sc scoping comments from our broad stakeholder audience here. And that concludes my presentation and I'll hand it over to Jennifer Maddox. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. I'm just moving several boxes around on my screen. So thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, so that was the end of our uh, presentation portion. And we are now moving into, um, it looks like we did great on time. So we have some time to answer questions. I've been, I have answered a few questions uh, via a typed answer. So uh, if you asked a question, I may have responded to you just by um, typing the answer. And we have a few questions um, that I've tried to break up into some broad categories. Um, that I will moderate and ask of our panelists. Um, and the first category that I see are some questions about uh, the CEQA process, the environmental review process and our early outreach process. And so I will uh, direct questions to our environmental review team, Jason and Eric Gillies. Um, so I, the first question, or a couple of questions that I will combine are questions about timing. So we have some questions asking both, when do we expect to complete and release for review our preliminary environmental assessment? And then how long will the overall process that was shown on the initial figure uh, during my presentation. So from now until potentially taking to the commission, how long do we expect that process to take? So I will ask, um, I will cue that up for our environmental staff um, to Eric Gillies um, to answer those questions. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, as far as the preliminary environmental assessment, we anticipate we're in draft form right now, but we want to do these focused stakeholder groups as we proceed that will feed into this assessment and then anticipate that timing to be two to three months, roughly anticipated time. As far as the overall process for the EIR, typically we try to um, complete an EIR within a year, but with complex projects that could take longer, a year and a half, 18, 18 months, um, does that help answer the questions, Jennifer? I believe that does. I'm scrolling through as additional timing related questions come in um, to make sure that we covered it. But um, yeah, so I, I think that, that I would just add that uh, there is some level of uncertainty. We purposely left dates off of all of our figures because we understand that things may change as uh, in terms of timing and we would rather have this process guided by a complete comprehensive and robust uh, and transparent process where we get all of the information that we need and all of the stakeholder input that we need rather than attach dates to it we will be driven by the process and the completeness um, and best efforts that we can make to obtain all of the information necessary to conduct the analyses that are um, essential to us making our 
findings at the end of the process. I think Eric, you did um, address the questions uh, asked by these attendees. Uh, the other CEQA related question or environmental review and analysis related question that we have uh, is related to the federal nexus and the questioner asks, um, is there a, will there be a NEPA lead and do we know who it is and when they will participate? Eric, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, so far, I've been in discussions with the Department of Defense um, since the project does involve Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, we've talked, discussed their NEPA process. Um, it appears they would be the most likely lead. Um, and we're still dis discussing these projects with, with the Department of Defense at this point. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just checking off as we um, answer these questions. So we have then a question that I would like to direct to Ken Foster. So this questioner would like clarification about um, what exactly, again, I know this is uh, something that we get a lot and, and we're happy to answer it to the best of our ability. Um, so this is related to clarifying what does it mean when an application to be deemed complete versus incomplete. And so I would just ask Ken to say a couple of more um, clarifying words about how our uh, complete application determination in the process is distinct and very different from uh, having completed our environmental review and analysis phase. So the questioner is uh, concerned that, uh, that we have deemed the application complete and how do we recon reconcile our determination of a complete application with the public opportunity to discuss the project. So I will uh, put that to Ken first and then uh, to Eric to clarify how the application process for completeness is different than our environmental review process and approval process under CEQA. Go Could ahead, you, Ken. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. I, I certainly understand how uh, a label of complete or incomplete could, could be um, potentially troubling uh, or misconstrued, but I think one of the things that, uh, that everyone needs to understand is that an application uh, with our commission is literally a form and labeling an application complete is the equivalent of saying, okay, you have filled in all the blanks on the form that are relevant to your project and we can now engage and move forward into the next steps of our process, uh, which may include, uh, as we've discussed, uh, you know, public outreach, conducting uh, studies to uh, begin to understand what environmental impacts might uh, occur, um, you know, formulating recommendations, looking at this, uh, you know, at an application um, for identifying, trying to identify what uh, potentially supplemental or additional information may be required. So um, this is the first threshold point in uh, the commission's process, and there are multiple opportunities for the public to engage, to provide feedback, to um, uh, potentially, uh, you know, influence that, uh, that project and that process. So um, we're in the very first, first steps of this. And I'll just add, when we deem an application complete, doesn't mean um, we're complete with the project. We're still collecting a lot of information, data that feeds into the CEQA document. So once the the application is deemed complete. We really dive, start diving into the CEQA, get all the baseline studies. Um, I think you heard in Jason's presentation that you know we're still gathering information until we get you know the public input through the NOP all the way through the draft EIR to the final EIR. <clears throat> Oops, was I on mute? We heard you, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So I hope that that. Um, clarifies the difference between determining an application complete versus the entire process of environmental review 
impact study and public and stakeholder outreach. Um, I just want, if it's not clear, I would like to um, encourage that commenter to uh, email us again and also to go back to the figures um, that show that we are at the very, very beginning of the process and, um, the, and then also review where we've identified are the opportunities for both uh, public meetings for formal comment and input, and also that we have sort of an informal ongoing um, open door policy for dialogue and conversation to uh, understand what people's concerns are, receive information that people may have that they think is important for us to consider and also to continue to ask questions. Okay. So the next question that I have, I'm going to combine a couple of questions that are related to the ultimate permitting of the projects and any priorities that we have. So this is related to um, part of Jason's presentation that showed the map of where the proposals are and statement that we, they are similar and so we are evaluating them together in a single EIR. And um, the question is, is there space for both projects or will only one of the projects be able to be selected? That question. So, yes, sorry, Eric. Yes, I think you're probably um, the appropriate person. Um, and I understand that you know, we may not have a clean answer to this, but I think it is one that many people are wondering about is how are we looking at these, whether they could both be permitted or if we have any kind of rule that only one is permitted. And I believe the short answer is that's up to our commissioners, um, but it is part of staff's evaluation. And I'll kick that to Eric to make uh, much more <laughs> educated remarks than me. Yeah, and I'll ask for Ken for assistance as well, but both applications are very similar. So we're gonna look at them in one EIR equally, assess the impacts for both projects. They're two separate applications. So they go to the commission. Um, so theoretically, um, the commission could uh, consider both applications or consider one or consider none. Um, I think Ken kind of brought that up in his presentation as far as when it goes to the commission for consideration. Do you wanna possibly add anything, Ken? Yeah, so um, the uh, applications uh, as they've been submitted, uh, they have a proposal for the areas that they would like to use. And I think one of the slides that we presented, I think it was one of Jason's slides that we presented uh, showed a graphic of where the boundaries for those proposed lease areas lie. Um, uh, if you were able to see, look at them in enough detail, you may have noticed that there was a slight area of overlap between the two. Um, but, um, you know, as, uh, as Eric said, um, the commission ultimately is the, the decision maker for us. Staff can make recommendations. Uh, it's up to the commission to decide what uh, they want to approve, if anything. And as Eric said, they can approve potentially approve both projects. They could approve one and not the other, or they could deny both. Um, we've talked about this, I think a little bit uh, in our preliminary reviews about what this might look like, but we have not come to any kind of, of conclusions that I'm aware of at this point. So it's still a matter that uh, is gonna require some, some discussion and will certainly be um, um, you know, part of this, uh, of our public outreach and uh, um, be influenced by um, uh, that, that public input. Thank you, Ken. And the add-on question that is related um, that I think I might try to answer and then pass off uh, to back to Ken and Eric is who has the ultimate approval authority for offshore wind projects? Is it the U.S. Navy, the state of California? Is it based on a specific number of miles from shore? So uh, part of this answer is there are multiple ultimate approval authorities. Um, there is an aspect of it that is based on the number of miles from shore. These projects that we're discussing on this webinar today 
are under the uh, State Lands Commission's leasing jurisdiction. So that makes us the main uh, approving jurisdiction uh, just because we are the land use authority, just as in a, um, say a, a city or a town or a county, the land use authority that would be your local uh, land use planning division would be the ones to make land use decisions. However, they are not the ultimate or the only or the sole. So within three miles from shore, there is a state federal boundary that is out at three miles from the shoreline. And within that is the State Lands Commission. That's where these two projects are. And that's what makes us the primary, not the ultimate, but the primary leasing authority. However, there are many other jurisdictions there, um, including the Coastal Commission, uh, the department, potentially the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and uh, other state and federal uh, agencies that would that we will be consulting with, identifying what permits uh, or authorizations are needed, and making clear to the applicants that while the State Lands Commission's lease is one part of it that their projects would not be fully entitled or vested until all other required permits have been obtained. So I would like to see if Ken or Eric have any other uh, comments to add to that. Yeah, Jennifer, I think you've, uh, you've covered most of the points. Um, this uh, state's jurisdiction does extend to three nautical miles, which is a slight clarification, three nautical yes, miles, thank a little you. bit further out than, than statute miles are. Uh, so there's a little bit more room there, but there's also a, a, a marine protected area offshore and uh, uh, next to the shore and the proposed project locations for these two uh, applications are basically sandwiched between the outer boundary of that MPA and the three mile limit. Um, but as you mentioned, Commission is only one of many regulatory authorities that um, the applicants need to gain permission from in order for their project to uh, um, hope to uh, be constructed. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Go ahead, Eric. I think both you and Ken covered it well. Um, of course, we don't have jurisdiction on the on the land side, so they would have to get the permission from the Department of Defense to go through Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, and so that's out of our control. If they would deny it, then they would have to modify their project to, you know, go outside of the Department of Defense. Okay, and a question, uh, related question came in as we were discussing this. Um, is whether we're aware if Santa Barbara County has any jurisdiction. Are we aware of that yet? I am not at this point. I think everything's on the Vandenberg Air Force Base, but we would consult, be consulting with the county, of course, being the, in the Santa Barbara County. Okay, great. So I think that what we'll do now, there's many questions that are related to um, details about the project description. Uh, and I'd like to turn to a couple of those um, to answer. And then uh, once we do answer a few of those questions, there are also some questions coming in about impact management and um, some impact uh, areas such as uh, fishing and wildlife. So let's turn first to some of the questions that have come in about the project design. And I think we'll shoot some of those questions out here for discussion, but I'll also introduce these questions by saying, these are all great questions that we will be very interested in um, having dialogue and discussion in our focus stakeholder meeting groups, because one of the key reasons that we have made the decision to go through an extra phase before we go into the scoping uh, that people are more familiar with through the CEQA process is so that we can understand uh, the, you know, as broad of an opinions as possible that will help us refine potentially uh, speak with the applicants about 
uh, design features and potential options that haven't been put on the table yet. So this is a really participatory process and we want to hear and understand those so that potentially even at the beginning of our uh, formal, more formal uh, CEQA phase, preparing the draft environmental uh, impact report and other uh, impact analyses that we may have design changes that or design ideas that we may roll in uh, from this preliminary assessment phase. So I just wanted to introduce this uh, particular category of questions by saying that, uh, but I do think there are some uh, sort of broadly applicable or public interest questions coming in with some project description or project design question. So the first question I would like to ask is, uh, I believe, Jason, you might be most equipped to handle this or potentially shot ahead. The question is, would both the IDL and Sierra Code gen tie lines to the substation be new lines or would they be taking existing lines and increasing the capacity or do we know? And this is related to, I'm going to combine two questions, related to the question, what voltage is required for the export cable and inter-array cables? And if we don't have that information handy, I would be happy to take that person's question and answer it offline or direct them to where they can find it on the website. I'd be happy to uh, try to that. So I uh, presume this is uh, regarding onshore. Um, because the question is being asked by both projects um, for the overhead transmission line connecting to the I heard the existing station. So I, I believe that's uh, substation N um, related to both projects. And so um, again, both projects are proposing construction of a new overhead transmission line that would uh, extend from the south end of Point Arc Whale to the which extending from at the south end a proposed construction of a Pro proposed uh, new substation, whereby from there, the uh, new constructed overhand transmission lines would extend to the north to substation N. Uh, so these would be new lines uh, connecting to the existing uh, uh, substation N. And um, I may confuse the um, voltage of the lines between the applicants. So forgive me, uh, IDL and Sierra Co, if you're on the line. Uh, I believe, uh, I think it was IDL that's proposing a, trans, uh, a transmission capacity of 66 kilovolts. And I think uh, one of the applicants was proposing up to 70. Um, I may be a little bit off on those numbers, but I believe those are ballpark with what's proposed by um, the uh, voltage capacity of the overhead transmission lines um, for onshore. Okay. Great, thank you. And a related question came in that I think that I will sort of take the uh, exercise some discretion to turn it into a potential comment or helpful suggestion. Uh, the question is, have we discussed co-location of the onshore transmission with the applicants, individual lines, increased land use and environmental impacts? Um, so I, uh, I wanted to highlight this question, but again, I think it is something that we can, uh, to the questioner and to everyone, this is something that I think will be part of what we uh, take back from this webinar and our additional focus meetings um, as a suggestion uh, to, for us to look at and to discuss as we move forward with um, our application review and our CEQA analysis. This would also be something that would depend um, back, hearkening back to an earlier question about the options that our commissioners have in terms of uh, alternatives, uh, whether it's one applicant, the other applicant, both applicants, and in many different uh, alternative forms of approval. So does anybody want, anybody else, Ken, Eric, or Jason, uh, want to clarify uh, about that question. I'd be happy to take, take a stab at that. Um, this is Jason. Um, I think going back to the original question, have we had the conversation with the applicants to combine, co-locate 
uh, the onshore overhead transmission line? The, the answer is no. Um, at this time, we're at the very beginning of the process, um, simply uh, uh, taking in, gathering information uh, for each applicant, the information that they've been providing with us. But, um, and obviously, as we've shown, the, each applicant is proposing a different um, uh, transmission line route, um, as explained in my slide. But certainly, as we move forward with preparation of the EIR and start um, working to identify feasible alternatives, that is an alternative we could consider um, if it uh, helps to avoid minimize environmental impacts as well as still meet the uh, goals, objectives, purpose of the project. Um, there, there could be some feasibility there. Um, we may also find that it's not feasible. And so um, that would be identified um, uh, as either feasible or infeasible and certainly in, in, in discussions with the applicants as well uh, to do that. But that's, that's something, that's an alternative we potentially could look at for the alternatives analysis of the EIR. Great, thank you, Jason. So a uh, question about, uh, I, oh, this is a good one. Um, this is a, about CEQA, but it's also about how we are managing potential impacts. Uh, the questioner asks, do we attach environmental monitoring conditions uh, the question as to the permit, uh, but we would be leasing. So would we uh, attach environmental monitoring conditions to our lease or approval? That information would be incredibly valuable to help guide offshore wind development along the west coast of California. Uh, and this person expresses their belief that we should uh, include monitoring conditions. So I would like to ask our environmental team, Eric and Jason, to say a few words about how we how it is that we develop our environmental monitoring conditions, both through the CEQA process and through our lease conditions. And Ken, I didn't mean to exclude you, um, but I think this is a great question and something that's on a lot of people's mind is how do we memorialize potential monitoring of both construction and operation to ensure that we are appropriately minimizing, avoiding, and managing environmental impacts. Jennifer, I'm gonna let uh, Jason and Eric go first, but I would like to add a couple of comments to one, once they're done. Thank you. Eric, do you wanna try that or do you want me to try to cover that? Yeah, go ahead, Jason. You kind of covered in your presentation with mitigation monitoring program. Yeah. So when we go to commission at the end of uh, the EIR preparation process and uh, for commission consideration to certify the EIR um, and lease approval, if the commission were to move forward with those actions, they would also be um, adopting the mitigation monitoring program uh, component of the EIR um, that would be ongoing and would essentially, as the project um, works towards being able to go to construction, that's where implementation of the mitigation monitoring program would come into play that would uh, likely be very long-term and, and ongoing for uh, monitoring reporting requirements for all uh, uh, in, uh, affected resources uh, subject to the mitigation measures, subject to the program in general. And this would cover the full gamut of resources, biological, uh, scenic, um, uh, everything, air quality, uh, GHG emissions, et cetera, the full spectrum of resources um, subject to the mitigation monitoring program. And so the answer is yes, um, that's the CEQA uh, component that would, would cover that. Um, and uh, certainly that would uh, be done in, in concert with the permitting requirements of other uh, permitting agencies as well that would be developed in coordination consultation with other jurisdictional permitting agencies. Um, um, so it would be, uh, we'd be working to make that consistent with their requirements as well. 
And that's just the commission's process. The applicants have will also be subject to every other permitting agency that will also have permitting conditions and long-term mitigation that they'll also have to comply with. So um, uh, the answer is yes, in short. And um, Eric, or Eric, did you want to say anything more in addition to that? Yeah, and the mitigation monitoring program that is adopted by the commission is attached as an exhibit to the, to the lease itself, as well as any other conditions, for instance, um, long-term monitoring. Um, we would expect reports, reporting to commission staff as well as other agencies as requested. Um, did you want to add anything on that, Ken, regarding the lease? Yeah, Eric, you just stole my thunder, but that's okay. Uh, no, our, our uh, leases um, uh, routinely include provisions, special provisions that reference uh, an EIR. In this case, if it's an EIR, we would reference the EIR and require the applicant to um, you know, uh, construct their project substantially in accordance with that, how it is described in the EIR. As Eric mentioned, the Mitigation monitoring uh, plan or program is attached to the lease as a attachment, and then and therefore becomes part of the lease and uh, is a requirement uh, that the lessee at that point uh, has to conform with. Uh, we also include provisions in the lease uh, that uh, may be special requirements that aren't mitigation measures, but are things that our commission uh, would like to see or or other uh, agencies. Um, uh, might uh, or input uh, stakeholders might have requested. Um, you know, there might be special conditions like the applicant needs to provide us with, as Eric mentioned, reports that are provided to other agencies, or there may be reports that uh, we're looking for, for for our purposes. So uh, there is a very um, active, um, uh, ongoing um, staff process that uh, includes that EIR and environmental review process as part of our lease documents. Thank you, Ken. So two more questions uh, that I'm going to combine from several questioners that are more on these logistics and then uh, looking at the time and wanting to make sure that we have time for our closing remarks and also to cover some, we've got lots of questions about fishing. So I want to ask really for really short answers to these, uh, just a couple more questions about the leasing and the projects themselves. And then I would like to move into some of the questions about potential fishing impacts. So one of the questions that I think we can uh, answer, or these two questions we can answer really quickly are um, uh, questioners asking about the power produced by these two projects. Will they be only used by Vandenberg? Will some of it go to the grid? And is there or will there be necessary a power purchase agreement for these projects to move forward? Um, and if these are questions that, uh, that we can refer people to the website or questions that we're not prepared to answer right now because it's uncertain, um, that's fine too, but, but they are on our questioners, our, our attendees' minds. So the question is about who gets the electrons? Um, and I believe I'll that might, yeah, I'll question for Jason. Yeah. I can address uh, part of that question, at least. Um, uh, I touched on this early on with the uh, uh, goals, objectives. Uh, similar to both projects. And um, so uh, it, it is a, an, an objective for the project to demonstrate as uh, both of these projects to demonstrate uh, potential as an energy source for Vandenberg Air Force Base, um, as well as the uh, California energy grid, um, I believe is, is phrased by both applicants. Um, as far as the, um, it, the substation, substation, and I believe substation in as well. Um, I have both the applicants um, in their project, uh, I believe are referred to as a PG&E substation as the utility provider for those stations. Um, to give you a little bit of background on those, as far as getting into the details of a power purchase agreement or getting into the more technical components of your question, um, at least from my background, I would, I would wanna research that further before attempting to answer that. Thank you very much. 
Uh, appreciate that clarification. And then the last logistical questions uh, that several people have asked, and then I'd like to move into some of the fisheries impact questions, is uh, do we know what are the lease terms? And I don't mean like conditions, but the uh, length of the lease. Um, have we decided on the term of the leases and uh, whether there are any off ramps available um, such that uh, if there are some unforeseen or inordinate adverse impacts, would there be an off-ramp? And I'll really quickly say to, to that last part first is um, in, we will be posting, again, we will be posting the slides and the recording, and we will also separately be posting our overall process figure that was shown at the beginning of the slide deck during my introductory remarks. And on that graphic, it does show both the um, phases in which we would have formal public comment opportunities at public meetings. And it also shows certain key decision points at which we would need to go to the commission to uh, get their decision on whether and how uh, to continue to move the projects forward. There could also be unforeseen, um, you know, nothing that we expect now, but at any time, uh, one or both of the applicants could, um, you know, their circumstances could change. So then I would just put to Ken um, to describe how we determine or what they've asked for in terms of a lease, length of lease versus how uh, we make that decision. And then I'd like to move to some of the fisheries questions. Sure, Jennifer. Uh, so in a nutshell, the uh, lease term um, is something that is often negotiated between the commission staff, commission, and the applicant. The applicant has the um, latitude to request a term that they'd like to see. That isn't something it's necessarily the commission is required to uh, to grant that. Um, our statutory authority allows leases up to 49 years uh, in, in most cases, but uh, commission has broad discretion in all those in, in aspects of establishing lease terms and lease terms are often decided or determined by the nature of the project, the nature of the use, um, you know, with a, a project like this where we don't have any prior uh, experience or information to deal with. Uh, there is every possibility that there may be triggers built into the lease that allow the commission to revisit it at some point during the lease term right. to uh, ensure that the uh, mitigation is appropriate, that, uh, you know, the special terms are being adhered to, and that uh, it, it's still something that the commission would consider to be in the state's best interest. Great. Thank you, Ken. And as a quick follow-up as we transition, uh, can we clarify for our listeners that we do require our applicants or lessees to provide funding assurances for all phases of the project, including decommissioning. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, so in just a few minutes before we head to our closing, we have a lot of questions about potential impacts to fisheries. How are we analyzing uh, our, the potential fisheries impacts? Um, and we have some questioners that would like to make sure that we are including in our analysis uh, the potential for increased port activity and ships uh, to be disruptive to fishermen? And do we know yet about what port uh, might be used as the main port for this project? I believe that was discussed during uh, Jason's portion of the presentation that it's not clear yet that many of the Southern California and Central California ports have, uh, are being looked at, but no decision has been made yet on that. And then the real pressing question that many of our attendees have is what specific efforts the commission is making to identify and minimize adverse impacts on local commercial recreational fishermen? Are we considering the potential for compensation for displacement impacts? Um, and then how will we interpret and ensure that we are using fisheries data uh, appropriately and realistically to judge impacts to fisheries. So that's many questions wrapped into one, 
but the gist of the question I think can be discussed um, and answered with Eric and Jason that this is part of our uh, environmental impact report data gathering assessment uh, and stakeholder outreach. And I would like to turn that back to uh, Jason, uh, primarily uh, supported by Eric, to just say a couple of words about how it is that we interact with our consultant and with our stakeholders and how we take that data in and evaluate it in our EIR. Thank you. Um, I, th I think the first part of that had to do with ports. Um, yes, the question, and the, I think I answered the port part that yeah. um, it's not known yet, but the, the main questions that are coming in are sort of questions and concerns about how we will be conducting our analysis uh, about the potential impacts to fishermen. And would we expect that, they, that we might have um, might consider uh, displacement mitigation uh, in the form of compensation. And I think you can say a few words about how we handle the data and turn that into our EIR analysis. Well, let me first say um, IDEAL has identified Port Wanimi as their preferred port location. Thank you. Uh, and Sierco uh, has also, is also considering Port Wanimi, um, but they're also looking at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. I don't believe they've uh, specifically uh, reported to us that they've uh, identified a preferred port location um, from the information that we have. Um, the information that we have from both applicants is focused on uh, the initial construction activities for assembly of the wind turbines and platforms as the a focus of activity that would be occurring at these ports. Um, I would say we need to better understand going beyond the construction activities and looking at the long-term operations um, to see if there would also be any um, ongoing maintenance activities for these wind turbines that would be going on during the life of the project from an operations standpoint. I, I, I'm tempted to say that, that we've received some uh, indication from, from both applicants that there's potential for that um, uh, during the life of the project as needed for maintenance activities. So that's a little snapshot of, of project activity, both from the construction, uh, short-term short construction, as well as long-term operations of the type of activity um, uh, for the project that would be going on at these uh, potential port locations. Um, um, from there, I would say um, we're going to be in information gathering mode for a while, and we specifically want to hear from uh, the, the commercial fishing industry what we should be looking at, what we should be evaluating, what their existing uh, uh, concerns are with these ports, and what they anticipate could be um, new or additional or exacerbated impacts that the project could impose on existing conditions. Um, uh, with these ports uh, related to the project to ensure that we've got a, uh, an accurate description of that and so that we can carry that forward with our impact analysis on how the project will, will impact um, these activities to them as well. Um, we can look at other existing studies that are available, um, other reports, things like that, um, and certainly we'll be wanting to um, uh, work with them all along the way here, you know, starting with uh, upcoming uh, targeted stakeholder meetings. They're, they're a very important special group that we wanna make sure we hear loud and clear and give them a lot of attention uh, to make sure that uh, we have as much as we can get from them, starting with the preparation of our preliminary environmental assessment and feed information into that. And then even more so as we move forward past that into preparation of the EIR, um, that we have a full baseline description um, of <clears throat> the uh, information objectives that I previously covered to be able to have a, a, a good, robust, informed impact analysis of the project activities to, to be fully um, covered in our impact analysis of affected resources and that we've been working, we've worked with them to identify um, mitigation measures, first work with them to try to avoid impacts to the extent possible, minimize them, 
uh, by way of project alternatives or other means, cha potential changes to the project. Uh, and if impacts can't be avoided or, or fully minimized, then the next step would be looking at mitigation measures <clears throat> to reduce those impacts to um, a less than significant level or, or try to minimize the intensity of the impact as much as possible uh, for that. And so those are the general uh, EIR goals uh, moving forward of what we would try to strive for and to have fully captured into our, 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 our monitoring, mitigation monitoring program uh, with that. Eric, did you Thank want to you add? so much, Jason. That was really comprehensive. Eric, if you had anything else, but we're ready to also to our time to head in to wrap up. Oh, I don't have anything else to add Great. at this point. So I just want to say thank you, everyone. I, we actually got to a lot of questions. Everybody's questions were very thoughtful, um, and we've made note of it, and we will be uh, keeping these questions and answers uh, to review as well to help us moving forward. There are a few straggling questions that I'm sorry we didn't get to, but um, as Jennifer does her closing remarks, I'm going to be um, answering these uh, through the Q&A chat um, and also following up with people. I just wanna remind everyone again to please visit our website um, and sign up for updates and save our email address. That would be a really great way for you to continue to follow these projects. And with that, I'd like to turn it to Jennifer Lucchesi to bring us home. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Ken and Eric and Jason and Shahed and our entire State Lands team. Um, I hope you all found um, that uh, this, this webinar as informative and useful as I did. Um, as Jason, I think, summed it up, we are in an informational gathering stage and will be for many months. So please don't be shy in reaching out to us. Check out our website, as Jennifer said, and um, we will be reaching out to all of you. Um, so please stay healthy and safe. Um, have a happy holiday season, and we will be in touch. Thank you again for your time. Bye. Bye, everybody.